Here on the floor, uh, but they've taken away my gavel. So that means we're gonna... <laughs> So everybody be well behaved. <laughs> we're doing things different because we're trying to do things different here at the county. Um, and uh, so we have a little bit different setup. I want to tell my colleagues that the microphones will capture uh, what we have to say. Um, you don't have to hold a microphone. You don't have to lean in uh, to the microphone. Uh, and uh, in this process, we'll also uh, uh, we'll be doing the exercise. There will be public comment, but it won't happen until the end. Uh, of the session. I'm supposed to read in the item. So this is item 25 of the regular agenda, which is consider study session on strategic planning, accept and file report on the strategic planning process called Vision Santa Cruz County and direct staff to return on October 17, 2017 with the final framework and timeline as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. Included is the county strategic plan elements, the community strategic plan elements, the department strategic plan elements, the strategic planning project charter, the LEAP program overview, the vision keywords, and the mission keywords. And I'm going to turn this over to our county administrative officer, Carlos Palacios, who, um, who who's, uh, whose brain this whole process springs out from. Uh, but he's gotten uh, Great help, and I'm really curious to hear about uh, about what's in store today and, and what's in store to come. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Leopold and members of the board. Carlos Palacios, County Administrative Officer. Uh, today's a very exciting uh, day for the county because we are having our first um, public study session on our strategic planning effort. Uh, I do believe that uh, establishing a strategic strategic direction uh, for an organization is one of the most important things that we can do as um, both as elected leaders and as their appointed leaders. Um, it helps to know everyone, have everyone uh, on the same page in the organization, in the community, and to know what the, the board's priorities are uh, in the coming years. So what we are doing today is having a, a study session that is meant to, meant to introduce strategic planning um, to the board and the public. Uh, and as well as discuss how do we do strategic planning and, and why is it important. We've already conducted this session with uh, our department heads at a retreat a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and yesterday we started uh, our um, leadership academy. It's uh, called the LEAP program, which is the Learn, Engage, Apply, and Perform program with over uh, 40 um, county administrative uh, staff. And that was uh, yesterday and it went very well. There was a lot of excitement in the room uh, as people are engaging in this process. So before we get started, I wanted to provide a little bit of context to the board and uh, to the public about how does this strategic planning effort fit into the work plan for the county over the next few years. So um, we're gonna queue up a little bit of a, a um, this is uh, a work plan that we've looked at for the, for the next three years that I've presented um, to staff and the board, and I wanted to go over it with the public. Whoops. Whoops. Yeah. Uh, this is basically just going over the next three years, and so you'll see that um, in the first year, uh, the emphasis on strategic planning, setting strategic direction for the organization. Now we're going to be working on a number of different initiatives this year, including uh, continuous process improvement. Um, you folks talked about that, in fact, um, when we were discussing in the board meeting that we just finished, we talked about um, the illegal dumping issue and how could we monitor that, and that's a perfect continuous process improvement type project. So we are starting uh, that initiative in a very um, um, pilot project kind of way. Uh, we also have implemented our Leadership Academy, which is meant to really get all of our uh, supervisors and managers on the same page and trained up with all the different initiatives we're going to be doing. So we're going to be going over the next two years um, with a CSAC endorsed uh, program 
that will allow our staff to be trained in strategic planning, continuous process improvement, and performance uh, management. Uh, we also uh, will be implementing best practices in the county and doing an organizational review. Uh, the strategic plan is our big initiative in this current fiscal year. Uh, we're gonna go over that in detail in the next few minutes, but basically we formed a staff steering committee which will be helping to design the process and one of the big outcomes that we want today from, from the board is your comments and guidance in terms of the process for the strategic planning initiative. Uh, we and we've already started training and having um, various methods of community input. Uh, we will be having study sessions throughout the year, and our goal is that by the end of this fiscal year in June, we will actually have adopted a multi-year strategic planning process, probably um, in the, uh, be a six-year time frame. Uh, we've already implemented the Leadership Academy, as I've explained to you. Uh, in next year, 2018 and 19, um, so we will have already adopted the strategic plan by this point, and so next year, at this time, we will be starting talking about the operational plan, which is really a way of implementing the strategic plan with more specific projects. And we will also be implementing a two-year budget, and that'll be next fis the 2018-19 fiscal year. So again, this year, the strategic plan, multi-year, next year, two-year operational plan, two-year budget, with the idea being that we would uh, implement the two-year operational plan by the spring of 2019, which again is carrying out the initiatives outlined in the strategic plan, as well as aligning that with the two-year budget. And so um, that is um, the next two years following that uh, also in the next, in that second year, departments will start uh, developing strategic plans. Uh, departments will have plans that will align with the overall strategic plan as well as with the operational plan. So we have to have an alignment between our departments. Uh, and the other thing is that the departments need to align with each other. And so that will be happening also in 2018-19. And then we get to 2019-20, this is the third year of this work plan, and at that point we will be uh, implementing a performance measurement initiative, and we will uh, have been um, carrying out at a countywide level the continuous process improvement initiative, which we will have been pilot, using pilot projects over the first two years. Uh, performance measurement is very important because that's how we measure how we've done in terms of implementing projects. Uh, to achieve our goals that are outlined in the strategic plan. So it's very important that as we implement the strate strategic plan in this fiscal year, uh, that we think ahead and think how are we gonna measure these goals and initiatives. And the, in particular, the performance measurement initiative will be tied to the operations plan and the two-year budget as a way to measure our progress. Uh, this is a little bit again about more performance measurement in 2019-20 and then the continuous process improvement also rolling it out full uh, countywide in 2019-20. Uh, so that is just to give you a little bit of context for how we will, um, how this strategic planning initiative fits uh, within a longer term vision. Uh, I would like to now uh, introduce Angela Antonori uh, who is gonna uh, conduct today's uh, study session. Uh, we discovered Angela through the CSAC uh, Institute. This is the county um, governmental training programs. Uh, she in particular teaches a course called Crafting and Implementing Effective Strategic Plans. And a number of staff uh, from um, the county administrative office took that course and just loved it and came back and said, we've really gotta work with this person when we do our own initiative. And we have been very pleased with her. She's already conducted the department head training and then the LEAP or Leadership Academy program training. Uh, Angela has a very uh, broad background. Uh, she's worked with a number of counties, including Santa Barbara, uh, County and City, Ventura, Eureka, Madera, Alpine, Riverside, Martinez, Sacramento. 
she's worked on a number of um, specific issue uh, initiatives like homelessness, jail overcrowding, HIV AIDS. And for the past 25 years, Angela's also been working on diversity and intercultural understanding um, in various uh, public sectors and in the private sector as well. So with that, I will turn over this uh, workshop to Angela and Tenori. Uh, I'm sure you'll be uh, very pleased to work with her as, as we have at a staff level. All right. Thank you, Carlos. Good morning. Morning. <laughs> I have, I am very uncomfortable when people are at my back and there's no way that's not going to happen today. So I'm going to move around and try to help uh, everybody feel included in what's going on. So thank you very much for scheduling this study session. Um, you have the PowerPoints in front of you. This, this, there we go. Our goals for this study session are pretty simple. We want to overview the strategic planning process and components really want to continue the momentum we've started to build with the energy around focusing on these things. And then also, really simply stated, this is based on Carlos's leadership, how to leverage strategic planning to get stuff done, right? And improve service delivery. So that's the bottom line of our, of our goal. And I should say that I'm really particularly happy to be here because I'm a banana slug. I right. went to UCSC years ago. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, one of the things that we've been successfully able to do is leverage some of the research that's been done on appropriate engagement and retention and, and involvement of staff and community in our work. And so we've been showing this thing that you can see here, a, a TED Talk, part of a TED Talk by Simon Sinek about the why. And I think that's enough introduction to the video. I'm going to encourage you to watch this. And we won't show the whole thing, so I'll let you know when it's time to stop. Go for it. How do you explain when things don't go as we assume? Or better, how do you explain when others are able to achieve things that seem to defy all of the assumptions? For example, why is Apple so innovative? Year after year after year after year, they're more innovative than all their competition. And yet, they're just a computer company. They're just like everyone else. They have the same access to the same talent, the same agencies, the same consultants, the same media. Then why is it that they seem to have something different? Why is it that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only man who suffered in a pre-civil rights America, and he certainly wasn't the only great orator of the day. Why him? And why is it that the Wright brothers were able to figure out controlled, powered manned flight when there were certainly other teams who were better qualified, better funded, and they didn't achieve powered manned flight, and the Wright brothers beat them to it? There's something else at play here. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery. And this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked, and it even profoundly changed the way in which I operate in it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP, but very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief. 
Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You ready to buy a computer from me? All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. And Dell. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with, anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Here's the best part. None of what I'm telling you is my opinion. It's all grounded in the tenets of biology, not psychology, biology. If you look at a cross-section of the human brain looking from the top down, what you see is the human brain is actually broken into three major components that correlate perfectly with the golden circle. Our newest brain, our homo sapien brain, our neocortex, corresponds with the what level. The neocortex is responsible for all of our rational and analytical thought and language. The middle two sections make up our limbic brains, and our limbic brains are responsible for all of our feelings, like trust and loyalty. It's also responsible for all human behavior, all decision making, and it has no capacity for language. In other words, when we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. It just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and the figures, and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart, or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do, and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody, how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal? 
and want to be a part of what it is what you, that you do. Again, the goal is not just to sell people who need what you have. The goal is to sell to people who believe what you believe. The goal is not just to hire people who need a job. It's to hire people who believe what you believe. I always say that, you know, there's, uh, if you, if you, if you, um, Hire people just because they can do a job, they'll work for your money. But if you hire people who believe what you believe, they work for you with blood and sweat and tears. And nowhere, nowhere else is there a better example of this than with the Wright brothers. Most people don't know about Samuel Pierpont Langley. And back in the early 20th century, the pursuit of powered man flight was like the dot com of the day. Everybody was trying it. And Samuel Pierpont Langley had what we assume to be the recipe for success. I mean, even now, you ask people, why did your product or why did your company fail? And people always give you the permu same permutation of the same three things. Undercapitalized, the wrong people, bad market conditions. It's always the same three things. So let's explore that. Samuel Pierpont Langley was given $50,000 by the War Department to figure out this flying machine. Money was no problem. He held a seat at Harvard and worked at the Smithsonian and was extremely well connected. He knew all the big minds of the day. He hired the best minds money could find and the market conditions were fantastic. The New York Times followed him around everywhere and everyone was rooting for Langley. And how come we've never heard of Samuel Pierpont Langley? A few hundred miles away in Dayton, Ohio, Orville and Wilbur Wright. They had none of what we consider to be the recipe for success. They had no money. They paid for their dream with the proceeds from their bicycle shop. Not a single person on the Wright brothers' team had a college education, not even Orville or Wilbur. And the New York Times followed them around nowhere. The difference was Orville and Wilbur were driven by a cause, by a purpose, by a belief. They believed that if they could figure out this flying machine, it'll change the course of the world. Samuel Pierpont Langley was different. He wanted to be rich and he wanted to be famous. He was in pursuit of the result. He was in pursuit of the riches. And lo and behold, look what happened. The people who believed in the Wright brothers' dream, worked with them with, for, with blood and sweat and tears. The others just worked for the paycheck. And they tell stories of how every time the Wright brothers went out, they would have to take five sets of parts because that's how many times they would crash before they came in for supper. And eventually, on December 17th, 1903, the Wright brothers took flight. And no one was there to even experience it. We found out about it a few days later. And further proof that Langley was motivated by the wrong thing, the day the Wright brothers took flight, he quit. He could have said, that's an amazing discovery, guys, and I will improve upon your technology. But he didn't. He wasn't first, he didn't get rich, he didn't get famous, so he quit. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And if you talk about what you believe, you will attract those who believe what you believe. Well, why is it important to attract those who believe what you believe? something called the law of diffusion of innovation. And if you don't know the law, you definitely know the terminology. The first 2.5% of our population are our innovators. The next 13.5% of our population are our early adopters. The next 34% are your early majority, your late majority, and your laggards. The only reason these people buy touchtone phones is because you can't buy rotary phones anymore. <laughs> We all sit at various places at various times on the scale, but what the law of diffusion of innovation tells us is that if you want mass market success or mass market acceptance of an idea, you cannot have it until you achieve this tipping point between 15 and 18% market penetration, and then the system tips. And I love asking businesses, what's your conversion on new business? And they love to tell you, oh, it's about 10%, proudly. Well, you can trip over 10% of the customers. We all have about 10% who just get it. That's how we describe them, right? That's like that gut feeling, oh, they just get it. The problem is how do you find the ones that just get it before you're doing business with them versus the ones who don't get it? So it's this here, this little gap, that you have to close, as Jeffrey Moore calls it, cl uh, crossing the chasm. Because you see, the early majority will not try something until someone else has tried it first. And these guys, the innovators and the early adopters, they're comfortable making those gut decisions. They're more comfortable making those intuitive decisions that are driven by what they believe about the world. 
and not just what product is available. These are the people who stood on line for six hours to buy an iPhone when they first came out, when you could have just walked into the store the next week and bought one off the shelf. These are the people who spent $40,000 on flat screen TVs when they first came out, even though the technology was substandard. And by the way, they didn't do it because the technology was so great. They did it for themselves. It's because they wanted to be first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. In fact, people will do the things that prove what they believe. The reason that person bought the iPhone on the first, in the first six hours, or stood in, six, in line for six hours, was because of what they believed about the world and how they wanted everybody to see them. They were first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So let me give you a famous example, a famous failure and a famous success of the law of diffusion of innovation. First, the famous failure. It's a commercial example. As we said before a second ago, the recipe for success is money and the right people and the right marketing conditions, right? You should have success then. Look at TiVo. From the time TiVo came out, about eight or nine years ago, to this current day, they are the single highest quality product on the market. Hands down, there is no dispute. They were extremely well funded. Market conditions were fantastic. I mean, we use TiVo as a verb. I TiVo stuff on my piece of junk Time Warner DVR all the time. But TiVo is a commercial failure. They've never made money. And when they went IPO, their stock was at about 30 or 40 dollars, then plummeted, and it's never traded above 10. In fact, I don't think it's even traded above six, except for a couple of little spikes. Because you see, when TiVo launched their product, they told us all what they had. They said, we have a product that pauses live TV, skips commercials, rewinds live TV, and memorizes your viewing habits without you even asking. And the cynical majority said, we don't believe you, we don't need it, we don't like it, you're scaring us. What if they had said, if you're the kind of person who likes to have total control over every aspect of your life, boy, do we have a product for you. It pauses live TV, skips commercials, memorizes your viewing habits, et cetera, et cetera. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, and what you do simply serves as the proof of what you believe. Now let me give you a successful example of the law of diffusion of innovation. In the summer of 1963, 250,000 people showed up on the mall in Washington to hear Dr. King speak. They sent out no invitations, and there was no website to check the date. How do you do that? Well, Dr. King wasn't the only man in America who was, the, who was a great orator. He wasn't the only man in America who suffered in a pre-civil rights America. In fact, some of his ideas were bad, but he had a gift. He didn't go around telling people what needed to change in America. He, you know, he went around and told people what he believed. I believe, I believe, I believe, he told people. And people who believed what he believed took his cause and they made it their own and they told people. And some of those people um, created structures to get the word out to even more people. And lo and behold, 250,000 people showed up on the right day, on the right time to hear him speak. How many of them showed up for him? Zero. They showed up for themselves. It's what they believed about America that got them to travel on a bus for eight hours to stand in the sun in Washington for, in the middle of August. It's what they believed. And it wasn't about black versus white. 25% of the audience was white. Dr. King believed that there are two types of laws in this world, those that are made by a higher authority, authority and those that are made by man. And not until all the laws that are made by man are consistent with the laws that are made by the higher authority will we live in a just world. It just so happens that the civil rights movement was the perfect thing to help him bring his cause to life. We followed not him, not for him, but for ourselves. And by the way, he gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech. So for people unfamiliar, TED Talks stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design, and they're free on um, shareware available online. 
Um, this one we've showed to all the county leadership groups. We wanted to share it with you so there's consistency and that you can see the connection. And what we've been looking to do, as, as Simon says, is create a tipping point in the inside county leadership. If we can get like that 18 to 20 percent of the leadership of the county to really be connected with their why and why of being of service and what's the core purpose of why the county exists, <coughs> we're going to be better able to design and implement an effective planning process. So I encourage you to think about your why. It's also not lost on me that every example he gave and everything that he talked about was about men. And the commitment that we have through the process is to be inclusive, transparent, and engage different people across different parts of not only the county, but the community in general. So I'm really pleased that there are community representatives um, here. With that, as part of the planning process, there are lots of different reasons to plan, including, okay, where do I need to point? There we go, thank you. To provide strategic direction. Uh, we want to know what good's going to look like. What's our North Star? And if collectively together we can decide, you can decide, um, where you're trying to aim, what's most important, what's core, what's connected to the why, and link that personal why with the purpose why of the county, we're going to be able to be strategic in our thinking and in your ability to get stuff done and to prioritize the limited use of resources. Okay, I don't know where to point this. Thank you, Carlos. Um, setting standards of excellence. One of the things that I see in a lot of different areas is people don't know what good looks like. They might do the same process. You know, planning is processing permits. Public works is fixing things in, you know, the public's interest. Um, people in health and human services are providing services wherever you are in the public sector. You need to know what good looks like. And so how do we know that we're focused on the right things and in the right ways? And what can we look at how we might do it differently so that we can be better at what we do? Um, coping with uncertainty and change. Uh, with uncertainty on major, major initiatives like healthcare, for example, and healthcare access. What does the county need to be able to adapt and respond to in order to be able to effectively engage and execute in service delivery? Um, another environmental uncertainty are things like floods, earthquakes, those kinds of fires, et cetera, right? So you can imagine what those are. Um, and finally, to provide some objective basis for control and evaluation. You as a board should be able to ask questions and have data that actually tells you if what you've asked for and what your constituents have asked for is being executed effectively. And there's gonna be differences of opinion and diverse needs, et cetera. How, do, how can we provide you through this planning process some objectivity for control and evaluation? With that, sometimes what I've seen is the questions about how to make things work and what's worked well in the past and in other areas, and also creating new and engaging energy because of the circumstances that you're currently in. So if there's been resistance to planning processes or past disappointments, one of the things that we've done is to make sure that the time and energy that stakeholders, and when we say stakeholders, we're talking about internal to the county as well as external stakeholders like the people here in the room um, or listening in. So provide assurances that the time and energy will be useful and that changes are um, actually implemented, that what people suggest are the things that need to happen actually get engaged in. And if they can't be engaged in, we have information about why not and we can adapt to what needs to happen. Another thing that we see is a failure to involve enough of the right people in the right place in order for the commitment to be strong. And so what we're looking to do is involve representatives of all the key constituencies in the planning process in a meaningful way. This is gonna include um, looking at, I think there's, here we go, real commitment results and real participation. So from an internal perspective, we're looking at first getting our internal house in order, getting that tipping point with county leadership about how we can then execute these things in the community. And then we will be reaching out to external stakeholders through diverse approaches. So for example, there'll be some surveys. We'd wanna leverage technology. There's the possibility that we could even engage some community stakeholder meetings 
in your districts. We can go to your districts, that kind of thing. That was very effective in um, a couple of counties that I've worked in. A failure to translate strategic plans into concrete action. You can see from the three-year timeline, there's the idea of linking resource allocation and outcomes measurement to this plan. A couple of things that tend to help create effective planning processes, elements that are helpful, include organizational readiness and commitment and capacity. Um, I'd like to do a shout out for the CAO and his team, um, Nicole Colburn, Melody Serino, and others who are working very strategically to engage the leaders across the entire county, including yourselves, um, and really leveraging this moment and this opportunity. Um, also, I'm trying to click here, okay, managing smartly against the right outcomes. Again, what are we aiming for? What's our why? What are the outcomes we wanna see? And creating a culture of learning where there's some ways to look at innovating and look at how we might be able to do things differently. Some of those ideas are gonna rest in our external stakeholders. Some of them are gonna rest in different parts of the organization than maybe we've talked with before. And so we really are gonna seek to engage people across both of those, um, those, and there'll be a nexus point between those axes. So intelligent risk in the way that sometimes there are federal requirements and things that make us do things the way we have to do them. We have the opportunity to look internally about the how, right? And if we're connected to our why, we'll be able to do the how if we allow people to take ownership in the process and the systems. I know in the conversations we've had with the department heads and in the LEAP um, groups, we've had suggestions and input about ideas that they've been thinking about and all we had to do was ask. And so I'm really looking forward to providing you and continuing to keeping you updated on the input that comes and the ideas so that you can be included and also hear what is coming from your talented staff. So when should an organization do planning? Um, there's a couple key conditions that I thought would be helpful for you. Uh, when things are going well, the stakeholders can feel confident that there's actually gonna, they're gonna be listened to. Those are both internal and external. You've already seen evidence of that the last couple months. And also when the organization is in a state of transition, you've got new leadership, and because that leadership is here, we're really looking at inclusivity and transparency as a means of communicating with the staff and then also the um, stakeholders, other stakeholders. So in the way of looking at strategic planning, some of the groups have different issues that are presented in front of them. And as members of the board, we want your phones to ring for strategic and important things and have you know what it is that's being done so that you can respond to your constituents. We don't want your phones to ring like popcorn when there's an issue and not have you know how you might be able to respond with what the goals are. So the strategic part of the plan we're looking at identifying what are the current realities, what kinds of things, and we'll talk about scan processes. Um, what are the trends that you're seeing? What are, the, what are your constituents telling you that they want you to be paying attention to? What kinds of changes are there in the community? Um, I live in Santa Barbara. Housing costs and housing availability is you know, off the charts ridiculous, just like what's happening here. So what kinds of changes are there that we might be seeing as uh, indicators of things to come? And how do these affect the staff and the work of the various organizations and um, nonprofits and community groups that work with you as well as departments and programs that are a part of your um, partnership? So with that, I'm gonna turn it to Nicole who's gonna take us through some of the next steps. So we wanted to just highlight for you some of the aspects of the strategic planning process here in the county that have already begun. Um, so as Carlos mentioned, we have um, formed a strategic plan steering committee and we wanted to get diverse representation from throughout the county. So we have representatives from each of the four areas of the county government. So within general government, our director of information services Kevin Bowling and Deputy Director of Personnel Ajita Patel are representing. Within the um, Health and Human Services area, we have Michael Beaton from Health and Ellen Timberlake from Human. From Land Use and Community Service Services, Wanda Williams is on the committee as well from planning, as well as Marcella Tavantes from Public Works. Uh, within Public Safety and Justice, 
We have Fernando Geraldo, our Chief Probation Officer, and Jeremy Varinsky, our Under Sheriff. And our Communications Manager, Jason Hoppin, is also participating. And um, I'm helping to lead the process and then being supported by David Brown in the CAO's office. Um, I wanted to just mention we have Angela Antonori, who's our professional strategic planning facilitator, and we will also be um, working with some local facilitators, um, and we're going to be defining that in the coming weeks. So the, the committee itself started meeting at the end of August. We have a project charter which we provided and a work plan, um, and they're going through their the purpose right now of the committee is to better define the strategic planning process, so we're meeting weekly and trying to um, refine the work plan and come up with the final framework and timeline that we'll be bringing to your board in October. The strategic planning process itself, uh, what we have here, we're outlining uh, the basic framework will be coming back to you, as I mentioned, but in the fall, we're going to be doing engaging internal and external stakeholders. Um, we're going to, we envision doing a variety of methods, so this could include uh, a variety of surveys, both with staff and the public, uh, district meetings, as was mentioned, or other specific focus groups. Uh, we may, we are, there's an interest in going out into the community and staffing various events and having uh, staff engage with the public. We can make our surveys available and also our website. Uh, we would like to bring to the board a draft vision, mission, values, and focus areas by the winter. And then in the spring, we envision conducting goal setting and then drafting and finalizing the county strategic plan so that it can be adopted by June. Uh, we, we want your input, so if there are things um, that you would like to see us consider as part of defining the strategic planning process before we come back to you, we, we would welcome those. Um, that feedback. So the components of our strategic plan, in the first phase, we're focused on the strategic plan document itself. So it's going to be comprised of some scans of current realities, as Angela had described. We're also conducting our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats or barriers analyses. We've done both of those with the department heads and the LEAP participants yesterday. We're gonna be um, generating vision, mission, and value statements. And then we're gonna be coming up with focus areas and goals. The focus areas are what we're calling our strategic initiatives, so they're gonna be relatively high level. And then the goals are gonna be somewhat more specific, but the the specificity will really be in phase two when we come up with our operational plan, which will be our work plan for implementing the strategic plan. So I will turn it back to Angela. Here, here I'll back up a slide. Um, a couple people have been asking questions. Just to let you know, at the end, we'll have some opportunity for you to ask some of the questions that you were interested in. I also encourage the board at this point, we've thrown a lot of information at you, so if you'd like to you know, interrupt me or, or something, please, you know, we'll, we'll engage together. Um, what I'll be doing from here forward is kind of diving into what we're doing in phase one. So if there's something that's on your mind, please let me know, okay? Um, did you have something? I couldn't tell by, yes, I'm um, Supervisor um, McPherson. Just um, in, in getting to the whys, uh, how, we have a multifaceted, uh, complicated operation here within the county with mm -hmm. 2,500 employees, et cetera. And I think the, the words integrity, inclusiveness, and transparency are, are the critical factors, but can there be a limit to how many whys uh, we should uh, try to address at one time? So interesting question, uh, yes. The thing that is really useful, especially for internal stakeholders, county staff, if we know why someone is a public servant, why did they sign up to be a steward of the public's resources from whatever department and things they're in or choose to be an elected representative, if we can tap into people's personal whys, they're gonna be better motivated and engaged to execute their responsibilities, the how and the what, more effectively. Part of what the steering committee and the internal and external stakeholders will be able to do is help inform us about what's the most important things that should be part of the why for the county. The county is this big entity that, like you say, is very multifaceted. 
I'm looking for ways to bridge between people's internal and personal motivations and their whys so that they can do a better job for us as the stewards of the public's resources. Yes. Uh, um, wondering maybe from your experience, you talked about the external stakeholders and their role, and what's the meaningful part that they contribute to this? Mm -hmm. As Supervisor McPherson said, thank you Supervisor Leopold, uh, the diverse needs and perspectives of your stakeholders are things that we're gonna look to try to find out about. So for example, with, did you wanna comment about the opportunities with youth, for example? Oh, so in regards to youth engagement, we are thinking of um, hiring youth through Human Services Department to actually go out into the community to get the youth voice because that's very important to us. So we'll be working with Ellen Timberlake and her staff to, to generate some unique engagement in that way. Other opportunities might be, for example, how we can leverage technology to get some survey data from people who might not want to come and attend a meeting. Other opportunities would be, like I said, to have some district hosted, you know, there's the possibility of a district hosted stakeholder meeting where you can decide, you know, how to be able to do that. No, I'm, I'm okay. trying to, I, those, are, those are tactics. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out what the meaningful, what's their meaningful contribution to this, right? I, I always believe the public should be involved, but I want to make sure it's meaningful because if we just come and involve them in an exercise and then they don't see their, their input reflected in the plan, then um, people become jaded towards uh, the public sector. So I, I like that meaningful engagement. I'm just trying to, from your experience, how does that manifest itself or what could it be here in Seattle? Okay, thank you for um, yeah. helping me amplify that. One of the ways I've seen uh, stakeholder input involved is to help prioritize limited use of resources, for example, or discretionary resources within the county. You have so many mandates and unfunded mandates, how do you make some choices about what's gonna be most valuable and important to the constituents? That helps with that prioritization. Another thing that helps is it signals to the staff the kinds of things that are important. The staff may be doing things over and over again because that's what they've been told good looks like. We may shift what good looks like a little bit and they're gonna have to navigate and we're gonna support them to navigate if there are any changes. That's why the process improvement initiatives. So if we can look at what's important to the external stakeholders and help fine tune or calibrate the use of resources and where we decide to put those together, we can do a better job at, at our stewardship. Great. And uh, you know when we did uh, the, back in 2009, we did a big community planning process in Live Oak and Soquel that involved about 500 people. About 100 of them were young people, and I'd be happy to share some strategies we used to engage them. Excellent. We're going to be looking at using facilitators who are bilingual, bicultural, experienced with technology, have you know some that are local, some that are neutral that don't live here, that kind of thing, so that we can try to get as objective of, of input as possible. And we're investigating some of the tools that are available to public sector entities. Um, I know Sven, for example, is, is vetting some things for us to look at how we might capture that data and put it into formats that actually is legible, accessible, readable, and useful. And we're gonna hold public questions until um, we get through the presentation. Yeah. Okay, all right. Anything else right now from the board? Yes. Um, do, do goals change, or can they change often? I mean, we, we have some moving targets, like the cannabis cultivation is relatively sure. new. Uh, healthcare, we really don't know what's, you know, we know what we have now, we don't know what we have in the future. Um, is, uh, if we're set on some goals that we want on some particular topics, is it, how, how far should we stretch if something new comes mm -hmm. up that needs to be addressed? Mm -hmm. As Nicole mentioned, your county strategic plan will have relatively high level overarching goals that will allow you to adapt and respond to the external realities that happen and the things that will impact your decision making and choices. Um, one of the things that I've seen work is to have a plan that's you know f four to six years, especially if you have multi-year budget processes, and to look at refreshing and fine-tuning the plan on a kind of correlated with the budget. 
So you'll be looking periodically at the plan to see what's working, what's not, what might need to be modified. There could be realities that emerge that we can't even imagine. Yet. And so you'll have that opportunity with ongoing checkpoints to be able to decide if something needs to be modified. It, it should be a living guidepost, set of guideposts, not a thing that's in cement that can't be you know, modified and used and adapted. It's a breathe, it should be a breathing, living document and guiding factor, sure. okay? So one of the key components of this is to do an environmental scan, and we've done this with your department heads and the LEAP group, which is to identify what people are seeing are the significant trends and demands in this region that may be signs of things to come, but either way, you need to plan for and be able to respond to. And we're looking to seek out new information so that we can breathe some life and some energy into and make it a living, growing, you know, alive, Piece so that some of the things that might happen is we may challenge some of our own assumptions. You may be under the impression that certain things are cause or correlation, and we may find through a really good scan process that there's different things that are actually impacting what might be going on. So identifying strategic issues and challenges facing the organization, um, things that happen at the federal and state level may have a direct impact on what happens here, and so how do we use the scan to help us be able to respond to those things. So the scan itself you see here is looking at political, social, economic, and other factors that could impact how you do your business. Another part of the scan process is to look at internally what's happening that are strengths and weaknesses and then also externally. What kinds of opportunities or threats or barriers are there? And I have the threats or barriers um, with a star because I find that certain folks prefer to not feel like something is a threat. It feels too harsh. And so, but there are barriers and obstacles for us to be able to do some of our work together. And so we will combine that and look both at what's potentially out there. A, an example of an opportunity might be how you can leverage your relationships with the cities that are within the county's boundaries. How do you communicate effectively and leverage the resources available across the jurisdictions or boards, commissions, air, air pollution control district, air quality management, et cetera. Um, so those are just examples of that. Uh, one of the things that's really, really key that I've seen be the deal breaker or deal maker on strategic planning is looking at the people. Um, so this includes your internal staff. I've seen over and over again, the more we have our internal house in order, the better are we, we are to in, uh, provide our services effectively to the, to the people who are counting on us. Um, so with that, uh, here's one example of involving folks, and we talked about this a lot in LEAP yesterday, is retaining and recruiting effective staff. I know other jurisdictions, I don't know what your statistics are here, but to uh, you know, hire a qualified law enforcement officer, they were having to have 200 applications before they could even get someone into an academy. So when you have that many people trying to apply for jobs that somehow aren't qualifying, how are we gonna navigate that? And with housing costs and other things, how do we make sure we're attracting people to the county um, to contribute what their skills and talents are? Uh, as part of that, I'm gonna again let Nicole speak to this. You've heard some, but let's hear a little bit more about the program that she and Melody and others are leading. So as was already um, stated, we launched LEAP yesterday, and that included about 40 participants from throughout the county at various levels. And so the objective of the program is to value and encourage the active participation of employees at all of those levels in strategic planning, process improvement, and performance measurement. So Angela kicked it off with a training on strategic planning, and we'll be bringing trainers, other trainers, um, to the county to conduct some on-site classes. We'll also be sending various cohorts through the CSAC credentialing program. The first 10 will be attending CSAC classes elsewhere at, uh, at other sites. And then beginning in September of 2018, CSAC will be here on, on, in our county conducting on-site classes. And so uh, there will be 30 additional participants going through that CSAC program next year as well as the following year. And we're also gonna be um, 
having some complementary classes through Santa Cruz County Learns, as well as others that county departments might hold. So there was a lot of energy at yesterday's launch, um, a lot of excitement around both the LEAP program and strategic planning, and um, it was great to see so many people involved. Uh, to support that, I've worked with a lot of different counties and have worked with the CSAC Institute for a really long time. And I can say that it's rare that I see the active level of participation and openness and curiosity that I've seen with both your department head group and your LEAF group. I really want to compliment the, the team that's put it together and the tone that you've set here at the county. Um, it's not typical to experience that. So with that, um, tips to avoid the status quo. We're gonna make sure that we get some data and one of the things that I see happening across various communities is that people get data, but they don't use it to drive decision making. And so some of the skills in LEAP, for example, will be around decision making and engaging with one another that way. And I encourage um, this process will have uh, the opportunity to really utilize what the external trends and changes are and how, and this may answer some further ideas for your question, Supervisor Leopold, in the business environment with both um, internal and external stakeholders. So I really believe that data is important. I believe it supports the staff and it supports you um, in terms of listening to your constituents. Uh, other things around supporting, avoiding the status quo, uh, we're gonna be looking to have you uh, work with the CAO's office and the departments to put together that data and tie allocations and expenditures to the goals and objectives and measure their effectiveness. We wanna have some accountability. Um, I really believe that a lot of staff do what they do because they really believe they're trying to make a difference. We don't necessarily give them the feedback or the opportunity to know that actually what they're doing is having the impact they're seeking to have. And so to use the data in that way can be very supportive for them. Part of the connecting to the why is gonna be about um, generating your vision and mission and your ultimate purpose as a county. And different obviously from you know private sector agencies, the public has to work with us as a county, right? We wanna shift some of that so that they get to work with us, that they get to be our partners, right? If there was the opportunity in certain things that we can partner with our constituents as opposed to having them have to work with us, everyone's happier. They're happier, the staff's happier, we can get more done. So seeking alignment with the why is gonna be um, useful. I don't pretend that everyone's gonna be happy and holding hands all the time, but I do believe that if people are clear about about what we can and can't do and why and why not, it feels respectful and trying to aim for that respect. So we've engaged your um, county leadership so far in why you do what you do, how you can impact the community, how everyone's lives can be better if we're all focused on that why. Um, I've used a lot of different resources from a lot of different entities, this information in front of you. I think uh, I like the tie in that it connects with heads and hearts. I think there's a spirit and a passion that some people bring to their work and I'm hoping we can really tap into that. It's not just the what people do, it's the how they do it. So we wanna generate a vision that engages people's hearts and minds. Um, I actually borrowed a quote from Martin Luther King as well, and I really like this, which is, you know, he has a dream, not I have an issue. And I think that's the, another thing that would be uh, useful and important. So there's lots of information we've provided to your county leadership, and we have generated some information that Nicole is then going to um, share with you. So at the, both the department head retreat and the LEAP training, we asked um, staff to write down their key words that they thought of when, they, when they, we were asking them to think about their, the county's vision and mission. So from um, the department head retreat, these are the words and the larger words um, are those that were more frequently noted down. So as you can see, safety, thriving, inclusive, and health were all very prominent 
in their minds. And we did a similar exer exercise for mission that we'll show you. We're gonna be doing this for each of the engagement efforts and then eventually hopefully combining all of the words to see across all the methods of engagement how what, what becomes more prominent. Can I, can I ask a question? Of course. Mm -hmm. The context of you know this word safety. I was, we're just trying to figure out you know sort of is that what some people were talking about safety of uh, from crime, safety from environmental, safety from the federal government. It it just it seems it seems like a weird the at least the, as a fill in the blank it seems like out of my Mad Libs it would not be the kind of word <laughs> uh -huh. that we would put in there. So I'm just I, maybe someone who was there could just help me fill that in. I think it means, it meant different things to different people depending on what their perspectives are. It could mean safety in the community, it could mean safety you know, related to their job and their mission specific to their job. I think it really, it, it, it comes from through different lenses. So I'm not sure if anyone who was there wrote that down and could say what it meant to them, but it, it really, I think, varies by person. So, I don't know if anybody Yeah, it's, it's just, it's, as I say, it's... Interesting, right? Yeah. So the perception and the actual execution on these things is going to depend. And again, the vision is an aspirational piece. I like to use the analogy of like a North Star. So if our North Star that connects to our why is, in a, if we just look at the things so far, inclusive, thriving, safe, and healthy community, you know, those are the kinds of trends that we want to move toward. Those can be some, again, guideposts so we don't fall off the, the edge. Maybe if we uh, can move forward to the mission statement, you can see the relationship between the two. Uh, the thing that's most important about this one is the foundation upon which you can build your goals and your strategies. Your mission is your how and your what. And so here's some more kind of guideposts for that. If your vision is a community where, then to bring that vision into reality, what do you do for whom and, and where you do it is just an example of a formula for that. This was, and Nicole, I don't know if you so want to So again, to this. Um, these are the keywords related to mission from the department heads, and you can see service, safety, community, collaborate, and efficient, among others, were um, more f frequently noted. One of the things that we're doing and the steering committee is going to be taking really seriously is, is sort of an, a review of what's out there and what's possible in terms of sample vision mission to help guide the process. And I'm going to be curious, Supervisor Leopold, to look at that, look out for that word and see how do different people mean it in different ways and, and then we can, you can work with us to decide how that might show up. Um, in doing some research in preparation, this is a few months ago, I reached out to King County because when I was doing some reviews, King County, Washington has a lot of information and a lot of different plans and a lot of different work that they've done. This is a sample vision and mission statement for King County, Washington. Um, I think it, it struck me because there were some things that were kind of resonating with what I've heard people talk about here in Santa Cruz. So there was one example. Here's another, San Diego. I, we were looking, uh, Nicole and the steering committee, at things within California as well. Um, but we are trying to think creatively and differently and not be limited to just those counties that we usually benchmark against, like our sister counties. We're actually looking at what's possible, taking this opportunity to really leverage possibility thinking. So there's, uh, there's San Diego's. We also are looking at what is actually in existence already. Which parts of the county have some strategic plans in place? Maybe their funders or you or other um, efforts are requiring some sort of planning process. So those will be incorporated in the consideration and deliberations of the steering committee. Human Services has this as their vision mission statement. So a lot of people have been asking, well, what do we do if we have some existing plans? Does this mean we have to toss those plans out or what's gonna happen? 
the answer to that is no, you don't toss them out. We're gonna look to align them. And so we're doing a, um, an outreach to the various county departments to see what's in existence already and how those issues might be considered by the steering committee and, and you all. Um, there's one more example, and then I'll give uh, Nicole an opportunity to amplify this. Uh, probation has their, uh, they use the word safe a couple times. Uh, so they've got their vision and mission statement here in front of you. Nicole, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would just reiterate, we've been asked a lot about whether we're going to consider existing plans, both uh, within the community and among departments, and we are. We attached some summaries that showed strategic plan elements and we're trying to be very conscientious of what already exists and how we might incorporate that information. We're gonna become our own plan operator. <laughs> <laughs> and having served on boards and commissions for the county, uh, one of the things that was interesting to me is looking at people have expectations of us as the county and if we're not articulate and we're not clear about what we can and can't do or a rationale if we can or can't do something, we're probably going to set ourselves up for disappointments. And when I'm looking at how we can keep your phones from ringing because people feel like they get their questions answered when they call the county department or receive the service that they need, this includes making sure that we have some articulated expectations. And again, in simple, plain language, what does good look like? What do we want it to be? And how do we know that we've gotten there? On measuring outcomes, um, the Hudson Institute is a well-respected entity. I really appreciate the role that you and staff are in, in trying to respond to very disparate, very diverse expectations and needs of your constituents, as well as what the staff needs in order to do their work. And so if we can all pay attention to the requirements and things and you know, really look at, I think that last point is one I'd really like to emphasize. Until we can do that, let's stop pretending that the problem is our lack of acceptable performance, but rather our lack of serious purpose, which connects back to the why. So let's make sure that we've incorporated, you know, good things. I've said this to you already. How can the people working as our stewards in the staff ranks not want to know if what they're doing is actually having the impact they want to have, right? Okay, so people we've talked about, we're gonna be doing and involving, uh, continuing to involve you and the steering committee. And I think this is just more information about the people part. Plans don't work if they're very well written and sit on the shelf. Plans work when the people believe that they're useful and that they become tools. And so I can't emphasize enough the importance of the involvement of your people and um, I've really appreciated the, the tone and the spirit that's been created here at the county to make that happen. So we have um, called or named this process Vision Santa Cruz County after going out to county staff to vote on a few options. Um, we launched a website before the county fair at www.santacruzcounty.us backslash SP. And we also have an email address, vision at santacruzcounty.us. We're gonna be expanding the website to help um, provide more information and also encourage participation and let folks know when we're gonna be scheduling various events throughout the county. So um, I encourage folks to go to the website to stay up to date. They can also sign up on our mailing list. If, uh, I wanted to add, um, before we close, um, just an example of how this process can work so that people can understand sort of from beginning to end uh, how it can make a difference in a community. So when I, uh, in my prior career as city manager in Watsonville, when I first became city Watsonville manager, we were recovering from the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, remember the earthquake uh, devastated Santa Cruz, but also devastated Watsonville. The entire downtown, uh, in fact, was devastated. And at that point, uh, the downtown was the key uh, sales tax generator for the whole city. And so your, your entire um, economic base was ruined immediately. 30% of the housing stock was lost overnight. 
people living in parks, people, um, Supervisor Caput remembers all of this, some of you did from your experience in Santa Cruz, but Watsonville was also very affected. At the same time, NAFTA was implemented. And uh, Watsonville was actually one of the only communities uh, designated as a NADBank eligible community that was not on the border. Uh, Watsonville, uh, during the time period of NAFTA, lost 5,000 jobs out of an employment base of 23,000 jobs, lost 5,000 jobs in the food processing industry. Uh, from Green Giant, Pillsbury, Watsonville Canning, uh, Bird's Eye, all of them leaving and going to Mexico. And so at that point, Watsonville's unemployment rate, annual average was in the high 20s. Annual average, it was 25, 26% annual average. It was, uh, in the winter it would spike at 30%, and in the summer during the ag season it would go down to 17, 18%. Uh, not normal, the unemployment rate annual average had been in the low teens, 10 to 11 percent, uh, prior to, to both of these things happening. So when we embarked on a strategic planning process, one of the things that we noted, of course, was our unemployment rate, um, but we also uh, set, uh, realized that in terms of attracting new jobs, uh, less than half of the adults in Watsonville had a high school diploma less than 10% had a college degree. And so in doing our environmental scan, we noted all that, and the council set a goal as economic vitality, right? Creating new jobs, creating a new economic base. Makes a lot of sense, overarching goal. When we went out to actually do the goals and uh, specific, more specific initiatives through input from the community, you know, we're talking about how does the community have input into a process, uh, the community said, well, our young people really need investment. Uh, we are, in particular, have a problem with un unemployment everywhere, but our educational level, our educational attainment is really uh, abysmal right now, and our young people need attention and need prioritization in this economic vitality. So in that overarching goal of economic vitality, investment in our youth became one of the priorities. And in, then in, in that, we realized that we needed to improve our educational facilities. And this, again, was community input coming to the council. And so uh, there was an obstacle in terms of getting to a Cabrillo College for our uh, young people. And so the Watsonville um, Community um, Center, Satellite Center, the Cabrillo uh, campus, uh, is a result of the strategic planning effort in the city. And you know what happened is the council set that as a goal under, okay, you started with economic vitality, went down to investing in our youth, helping them to become, their, improve their educational attainment, and then it became an actual project, get a Cap Cabrillo College campus in our city. So the city actually invested a majority of its redevelopment funds for a time period in that Cabrillo campus, a big chunk. And that was not normal, right? <laughs> that was not normal for redevelopment agencies. Redevelopment agencies typically were doing, chasing sales tax dollars, and that was the conventional wisdom. But uh, the idea was to partner with Cabrillo College, invest, make a big investment of our redevelopment dollars, also go get federal funding, so there was a Economic Development Administration Department of Commerce grant that was jointly applied to with Cabrillo and Watsonville. And the former Co-America Bank became the Watsonville Satellite Center for the Cabrillo College campus. And when that all came about, uh, when we spent money um, investing in purchasing that Co-America site, when we partnered with Cabrillo to use redevelopment to build that site, there was not a question in the community or council about why we were doing that. Because we had been talking about it for the last five years. It was in our strategic plan. It was in our goals. We, everybody knew. So it was the most non-controversial investment we ever made in our redevelopment agency. But yet, it was unusual. If you looked in the context of what was going on across the state, people didn't do that. But yet, when we got to that point, everybody understood why we were doing it and what the context of that was. And that is also the kind of thing that takes multiple years. You can't do it one year. It takes working with the Cabrillo College Board of Trustees, right, in a great, very close partnership. 
John Hurd in those days, the president of Cabrillo College, very open to working with us. Again, it wasn't something that Cabrillo could just do on a, on a dime either, they had to plan. So again, multi-year planning, community input, uh, planning that results in something. So when I look at that college campus, it didn't just happen. It didn't just appear overnight, it was the result of a thoughtful, long-term plan and using our redevelopment money uh, in a way that was not thought of as, con as conventionally very appropriate to do, but what, in retrospect now, it looks like the most brilliant thing we ever did with our redevelopment money, right? Uh, that campus has over uh, 1,500 students now every day attending that college campus, and a lot of young people have, have been benefited from it greatly. So I just wanted to put that in as just one story of how this plan will, at the end of the day, help us set that North Star, set a specific operational goals, align our budget, and then have outcomes. And so it, for us, it's a, an exciting process, and I hope the board uh, will give us input in terms of along the processes, how we should design our process, um, and how we should uh, conduct the various community input levels at this stage as well. Uh, with that, that concludes our presentation, and I'll just turn it over to the board for questions and dialogue uh, from us, and then after that, you can have your community input as well. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Palacios. I think one of the things that I think it's important for uh, the board uh, to, to show in lots of different ways our support for the process. We, uh, we have been talking about this process informally uh, with the hiring of the new CAO. We talked about it much more concretely, and I think we're all very excited. And it would be great to just hear from the five of us about, about things that you want to see or things that you think are important or feedback on, on what's been presented uh, because it's important for, for our leaders to know of this process. It's important for our steering committee members to know and it's important for the public to know. So I'm going to turn to my colleague, Supervisor Coonerty, first. Sure. Uh, well, first, I am excited about this. I think it's, it's uh, long overdue and it's really going to move us, especially when we operationalize it. Uh, into some really exciting opportunities for the community. Uh, so please keep doing it. Uh, I know it's on top of everything else you're trying to do, uh, and so it's not easy, but I think it's, it's incredibly important and it'll pay long-term dividends. I have sort of four observations uh, that I thought uh, could maybe inform the work going forward. One is this idea of really starting with the principle of equity. Um, this board doesn't look like this community. Uh, the, the people of the county uh, who work at the county don't reflect this community. Um, and even when we go out and you know, take input, that really may not reflect uh, the community. And we want to make sure that we're really figuring out ways to include as many voices as possible. And even when those voices are not included in the process, figuring out a way that we start with trying to understand where people who, who interact with the county are, um, are coming from. So I think that's really important. Uh, the second one is that I do want to make sure that when we get to outcomes, and it was helpful to see some of the other strategic plans and the differences between uh, the different counties and how they approached it, that we really want to focus on community-based outcomes uh, that, are, that are tangible, so we don't want to have a plan that creates more plans or to develop more plans but actually reduces crime, reduces the number of homelessness, increases the number of people having insurance, uh, like that are tangible things that some of which are in our control, some of which aren't, but that we, that we make sure that we're getting to the why, which is the quality of life for people in the community. Um, and so I want to make sure we get that and that those outcomes have um, that the data is where there's comparable data from other counties that are similar so we can see how we're doing vis-a-vis -vis other counties. So because we don't want to control all the things that may drive the crime rate, at least if we have the comparable counties, we can see overall trends and maybe uh, pick up on what uh, differences other counties have that are working or not working. Um, this, the third point sort of goes off that, which is um, I think there's a temptation in an organization like ours to focus on the what, on that we're service delivery, because that's what our 
grants do. That's what a majority of our staff do, does. But to remember that as an organization and a large employer, as a large grant provider, um, we can play a really important role in convening the community. We can play a really important role in cajoling other institutions to do things. We can create incentives for the private and public sector investment. Um, and that we don't just focus on service delivery outcomes, but overall our overall role uh, in the community. And then the last one is, um, and this is one of the most exciting things about this, is recognizing that uh, from this, this, that this organization is essentially about the quality of the people who work for the organization, and that we're a talent organization. Uh, and so how are we developing, retaining, uh, attracting the best talent, because all the great goals and outcomes and planning in the world won't work unless we have people who can execute on those. Uh, and so making sure that, uh, that that's sort of central to how we're going to operate in all these plans going forward. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and I appreciate Supervisor Coonerty's comments. We had actually spent some time uh, traveling to other counties throughout the state uh, during the initial process for the hiring of the CAO and learned that uh, those that seemed to be working the best and had the best community-based relationship also seemed to have strategic plans uh, and two-year budgets and performance-based budgeting. And, and what was useful was it, it answers a very simple, it helps answer a very simple question, is what we're doing actually working? And what I think is, is interesting is I, I recognize we have the talent to do it, but I think that structurally we haven't created the flexibility for our employees to take chances to innovate and then retool if something isn't working. So what we end up doing is consistently being told we just need more money toward X without any actual performance measurement to know whether X is working. And you may even have an expert in that department that knows inherently that something isn't working but hasn't been given the historic flexibility to actually take that shot. I think that what the board is saying uh, to our staff is, is that we trust you to take these chances moving forward. Uh, we trust your expertise. Uh, we want to give you the flexibility to innovate and to take those chances. And then when we do the performance measurement, if it's not working, that, that's not a judgment. That's just an opportunity for us to shift towards something that is. And that is, that is a fundamental shift in how the county has done everything everything. But it'll improve service <laughs> delivery. I think it'll actually improve uh, employee morale in the sense that people will feel that they went to school for a certain thing, they have a calling for a certain issue, and now they're actually being allowed to uh, be the experts in that, uh, liberated in a way to actually provide true, honest feedback to the board. I think that it's going to be incumbent upon the board to also recognize, to, to be willing to acknowledge that something isn't working, even something that we've been doing for a long time, and to uh, be okay with that, to tell the community that we have invested in this for an extended period of time, but it doesn't work anymore, or it didn't work to the degree that we thought. Uh, there, there's nothing to be ashamed of in that, as long as we're willing to have that honest conversation uh, with the community and with our staff. I think that this. Uh, this is uh, an outstanding opportunity to do all this, and I'm really looking forward uh, to the end result. I do think the transition is going to be difficult. I think we have to be honest with ourselves, both uh, with the community, with the board, and with uh, employees, that if you're asking for a fundamental shift in how things have been done, and you've done something a certain way for potentially 30 years, uh, that's tough to change. It's tough to change. But you can't look at the current outcomes in the county, meaning the high housing costs, the difficulties in transportation, uh, the recidivism, a colleague's favorite got it, word. Got, it yeah, in there. Got, got recidivism in there again. <laughs> and say that what we're doing is working to the degree that's fully serving our community. We can't say that right now. I don't think we can, uh, we can say that we're, we're doing the best that we, ha we have with the current processes that we've got. But I think that we've got to break down those walls to see if we can do better. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. But I think that that transition is going to be hard. I think it's going to be hard for department heads. I think it's going to be hard for the staff. And I think it's going to be hard, actually, for the board to say, look, we're committed to these specific investment areas. And when people come in and try and lobby you for other things, no, we actually have to stay consistent to 
the things that we've gone through an extensive public process to do. So I know that we've got a large task ahead of us in doing uh, governing in a different way, but also the employees uh, are going to have a completely different way of, of doing things over the next couple of years. But I think that that's good, and I think the time is long overdue. Thanks you for sharing that. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, and I, I agree totally with uh, the previous comments. Uh, this is really the start of something big that hasn't been done, uh, certainly in my five years here and for the last several years. I, I just want to make sure that our, our plan is results driven, performance driven, not study driven, uh, so to speak. That we, we look at something, we think that could work, and so we study it again to see how it can work even better. Let's, let's make a commitment. Uh, let's, after a thorough review, and get going. Um, and I, this is not going to be a rush job. It's going to take a lot of time. Uh, I do think those, those uh, words of integrity, inclusiveness, transparency, equity uh, are, are the key factors in this. And to have, in the inclusiveness in particular, that people have a word into uh, defining where we're going to be going in the future and that they have confidence in that. Uh, so we can tell them, as was explained, why we're going in this direction. Uh, I think we, we have tremendous opportunities here and I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing them out. Great. Supervisor Caput. You know, I look, uh, I want to thank you for, uh, you know, coming and everything. And uh, I think I look at it a little bit differently. Uh, I think we have uh, actually come a long ways in the last few years. Uh, we went through a great recession and uh, we, we kept functioning and we did very well. Uh, this is an opportunity to make things a little better. Um, I don't think uh, we were uh, broken. If it ain't broke, uh, broken, don't fix it. So uh, I think we're at a point where we can you know, improve and go forward from there. So what I'm not doing is uh, saying that the last few years were uh, done incorrectly. I think, they, I think we did a great job in the last few years getting through some very difficult times. Uh, this will be good to go forward, make things better, and uh, also working with the uh, department heads, getting their ideas, and certainly the public uh, input uh, in everything that we do. Uh, we work for you, we work for the public, public servants. Um, and so, uh, and with the academy, uh, how many academies are we talking about? How many training sessions are we talking about? Uh, I don't want to get into a, uh, where I'm going to school when I should be out in the community uh, talking with people and getting to know what the real problems are. I'll do a, a quick answer to that and then ask Nicole or suggest Nicole to, to work with that. I know Melody Strino is doing a lot of work we're looking at. I do a lot of work with the LEAP program in Ventura County as well as CSAC. Everything is being done in relation to that CSAC Institute kind of focus. And so the idea is how do we help staff do their jobs better, more effectively? How do we create environments where they can ask questions? Some of the courses or opportunities for people to come together are going to be applicable to their work. So in this case, for example, yesterday it was about strategic planning. We're going to be involving them in their departments. It's good to let them know what's going on. We're trying to create that tipping point. Another example might be change management and decision making and how they can employ effective leadership in helping support those kinds of uh, responsibilities that they have in their jobs regardless of what department they're in. So it, it's not like they're in a class every week, it's that the classes and the opportunities to come together are selected strategically for what's needed at this point at the county. Like to add to that, Nicole? Yeah, I would just say we're trying to not make the Leadership Academy onerous, so there would there will be about one training day a month when CSAC is here on site. Right now, um, we have 10 people going through the CSAC, CSAC Institute, an off-site location, so they will be attending about one training per month, but um, we will, of course, they're going to be continuing with their existing work and fitting in the training. Uh, 
So who exactly is going to CSAC right now? So there are 10 participants who we've selected to go to CSAC. They're from all over the county. Um, I don't have the list in front of me, but um, I know that they represent each area of the government. And uh, the other, uh, what, what is the cost? Uh, what, what are we paying you, I guess, uh, for the consulting? We're paying me an hourly with the idea that we're going to leverage internal talent as much as possible. So I have scopes of work to work with LEAP as needed. So I have not to exceed of about 30 grand. I don't know that we'll use all that. So it's not like I charge something up front. It's we're going to be leveraging my time and support and the time and support of external facilitators for that objectivity um, as needed. And I'll be taking direction from both your CAO and Nicole <coughs> and Melody on those uh, those efforts. And that would be that would be like thirty thousand for the year or thirty thousand for <coughs> a, a session or how many? Oh no, no 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 for all of the work behind the scenes and in front and over the course of the fiscal year, et cetera. And I don't, like I said, I don't know if we will even use that. I, with public sector agencies, I like to do a contract with a not to exceed, because if you don't need me, you don't need me. And if you do need objectivity, then you can leverage me. So they're responsible for guiding me on when and how they use my time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I just want to share uh, a couple different thoughts. First of all, I'm really excited to, to be at the start of this. Um, uh, I appreciate uh, my colleagues who really pointed out to me about the other counties who use these strategic planning processes, and I've tried to, to find out about them myself and understand what was going on. And in my conversations with, uh, with our CAO, um, he also has helped me sort of see where the value is. And I know that as uh, since coming here as a supervisor, since being elected, um, we have not uh, spent the resources we should in investing in our staff. Um, and some of those were external forces. We, we went through this terrible re uh, recession. Um, we, we had to lay people off. We had to close departments. Th that was it's understandable that we were just holding on by the by our fingernails for most of that time, um, but if if just like a great baseball team, you have to keep on working with your w with your team uh, because even if they're great, you, they still need a hitting instructor, they still need the the pitching coach, they still need all these different pieces to help them stay as sharp as possible, uh, and they use data and they use technology to sort of make sure that they can return to their next winning season. And uh, we've accomplished a lot here as, in the county workforce. And uh, we are innovators. And uh, I like to say that Santa Cruz is a great laboratory um, because although we're a small county, you know, in, in terms of size, we're about mid-size in terms of population uh, in California counties. And so uh, given the the, the networks uh, that we have, we get a chance to try out a bunch of different uh, elements and that we've set the pace on, on lots of different uh, programs for the entire state. So, uh, so I want to harness that innovation and creativity and uh, strengthen the entire county family. I'm really excited about the LEAP program uh, because I think that, that the idea of breaking down the silos to, to cross-train, to, to, to have departments, uh, leaders meet each other. I, I think that strengthens the county family. And um, when we can get out of this thing, well, that's not my responsibility, that's that's department's responsibility, uh, and say this is our county's responsibility, then we're a better county. We will provide better services to the public. Um, and we, we will leverage our resources more successfully um, uh, when we don't have those, those, um, those walls between us. So I think the LEAP program is, is, is great. Um, I also think this process has the opportunity to, to really help our, the county family and the community as a whole. And I'll just say a, a couple different things about that. One is if we're going to do this planning process and we're going to try to look at things new and we're going to try to look at the, sort of these big strategic questions and maybe lead to, to department plans that are going to follow strategic directions, 
we have to create an environment where it's okay for people um, to challenge the, the status quo, right? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not gonna work if we could say, well, that, that, that we could do things differently and that might work, but uh, he won't let us do that or she's gonna uh, say that uh, that's not the way we do it or put a constraint on it, right? That, that we, we can't do everything. Right there, there are there are actual limitations, but if we really want that engagement from our staff, we have to provide an opportunity for them to really feel like they're part of the process, and that's the same way with the public. Right, as, a, as I mentioned earlier, my, my experience says that when you when you give people when you gather people together and ask their opinions, and then they see their opinions reflected in your work, they'll come back again because they. They like being listened to. It's no fun to be talked to. So, so I, would, uh, as a, we do the public process, I want to make sure that those, that's meaningful engagement. And as we do the uh, process with our staff, they have to be meaningful engagement. And part of that is, is creating that environment to happen. I do think that we, that we um, need to ensure that as we had that community conversation, that we are representing the diversity of the community. Uh, because if you look at the demographic trends, so what we, th what they think Santa Cruz County will look like in 2050, it's very different than what it looks like now. And if we do not in 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 incorporate uh, uh, the voices of seniors, the voices of uh, young Latino families, w we will have missed what the future of this county is expected to look like. Um, and that's gonna take some work, as uh, I've been working on lots of different ways in my district to, to ensure that I'm representing everybody, and that we've, uh, we've had uh, some success and, and some failures, right? I mean, some, some efforts to do that. And we, we have to be able to make sure that we're including those uh, diverse voices uh, if, we're gonna, if we're gonna go out to the community, because we want this plan to be the community's plan as well as the county's plan. And I think that there, there's an opportunity to do that. Um, I also uh, would just uh, finish that, to ask that everyone understand that this is gonna be a, a fluid and changing process, um, that there are not defined goals of which strategic goals we're gonna go, how that's gonna be, the, uh, this board doesn't necessarily have them, the, the, I don't think the CAO has them, um, and so if we're coming out to ask your opinion, it's because we really do want it, and we really want your, uh, your input. Um, and as I, as I think everybody understands it, it will make us a stronger plan. Um, so this, isn't, this is a good process for the county uh, in terms of us thinking about the county. I, I know just in the conversations about selecting our new CAO, that was a good process for our board to talk about things we wanted. Uh, so engaging this conversation with the, uh, our employees and the community about these things will, will, will sharpen us and, and, and make us a stronger community. So I'm really excited to be, uh, to, to be where we are. So thanks for your work. I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Um, now we'll open it up for members of the public. Uh, this is your chance to weigh in on it. Um, I think we're going to bring out a, a, a microphone so you can get a, so you'll be heard. Testing. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold. Uh, just to identify myself, uh, one of the trees from the county fell on one of my properties in February. Uh, we're still waiting for a permit from the planning department. We were told we were put on a, uh, an accelerated list. So it was you, five people, that abolished the board uh, uh, appeals commission and appointed yourself the commission. So we can see how that works when you bring outside information or assume that type of information. Also, the board. Uh, accepted from ICLEI, which is a front for the UN and the World Bank, uh, 63 pages from the planning department. So you're running on homogenized laws 
which don't apply to this community. They're intended to prepare for a North American Union. You're not looking out for your people. Just as this lady here, you're not talking to the audience. In fact, that, that brochure that you have all in front of you, you did not provide to any of the people out here or have it on the back. It is not democratic. You're not looking for people's input. Um, She's making presentations to take and teach your staff uh, a mindset. When we elect you, we hope that you appoint a staff that reflects your views, your positions that you took when you elected. You're not supposed to go in there and homogenize your stuff. In fact, it was Mr. Bruce McPherson and Sam Farr that presented this futures program that she's presenting right now in Monterey. And it was a futures network. He used both his staff and Sam Farr's staff who flies the United Nations flag when he was in there and brought in that was the head work of Agenda 21. You're to look out for the sovereignty of the individuals and your individual office and thank her for her time and appoint and select your own staff. Don't bring in the globalist and the mindset. Uh, the words they use up there are trick words in order to massage stuff and get things over on the people such as sustainable. We've heard that when you've adopted Agenda 21. You are betraying your oath. Uh, take down that monument dedicated to Hugh DeLacy, who belongs to four communist spy rings. We talk about monuments being taken down across the United States, but he was in favor of Hitler dividing Poland with the Soviet Union, yet you proudly manifest two of those uh, monuments on the steps. Reread your oath to the Constitution. Make this county independent and strong. I don't care what your policies are. Make them yours, and don't subject your staff to the global only that she's brought in. No offense to her. She's just doing her job. But if people saw the foundations and the massaging of the trick that they're putting over on you, it's outrageous. Dismiss this idea. I thank you when you represent, even when I disagree with you fiercely, on your own staff and your own positions. Don't submit to this. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address this? Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. And I am encouraged by what I hear. And I hope that it happens that you folks have come down to the public level here is very symbolic. And I want to thank you for being willing to take that risk. As a member of the public that is very interested in what's going on. I find it um, discouraging that when I come and speak, as I did this morning, I'm told I'm taking up too much time, which is what you said. So if you really want the public to be involved, I think you need to start holding some evening meetings, like what you're going to do tonight for the flood control. I've submitted many petitions with many signatures asking for at least one evening Board of Supervisor meeting a month. And it's never responded to, it's, it's, it has never even been discussed publicly on an agenda for your consideration. So I'm really hoping that there will be changes. And thank you, Mr. Palacio, for bringing at least this opportunity to have a public discussion about where we might go and how things could change and how the public really could have their voices heard. Chairman Leopold, you said that, you know, it's, it's encouraging to the public when they hear their comments um, from public meetings reflected in policy, but that's been a real problem. And I've seen that over and over. I'm not the only one. When we have these community meetings about a development going into the community and, and we have all these tablets on the board and, and people write their comments, nothing happens with those. And in fact, the policy, it seems to the public, has already been set. It's already been made up in advance of those meetings, and the public meetings are merely to check off the box so that you, your agency, can say that there was public input. But what really happens isn't reflected at all of the public and what we said. And that's happening a lot, and people have stopped coming to those meetings because they know it doesn't matter. That has to change. And I'm hopeful, Mr. Palacio and Board of Supervisors, that it will. An example of that is um, the county's um, on the website saying that you really care about historic preservation. 
of our, our wonderful historic and cultural resources. And yet, in policy with the planning department, a demolition permit is free. And staff time is waived when you demolish an old building. And that has happened over and over in our county. It has happened in Aptos. And it's happening all over the county. There's no focus on water. There's con no connection with water. And um, I really hope that we do look at the trends in neighboring counties because what happens here Thanks, is reflected it, it by what's up. happening in Santa Clara County. Thank you very much. And thank you for the TED Talk. It's going to make me really sit back and think why I do what I do and hope that others will as well. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Silvera. My name is Ed Silvera. I'm the founder of Villa Brands for 40 Preservation Society. Uh, this, this is very promising. And I, I agree with everything Becky said, um, and, and also especially that you're coming down to us or with us during a, a public process, meaning more of an interaction. I mean, this is very positive. So we're hoping that, that uh, our community input could be more seriously uh, considered during these public processes. And also, you can't create a future unless you're, you represent the true history of a community. And we have a very significant history here in the county, and it needs to be considered, and hopefully it will be considered in this process, our historic cultural resources. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, seeing none, I, I just want to say just a, a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, to Ms. Steinbrenner, I hope before you write your next column that you actually review the tape from this morning to know that I did not tell you you were taking too much time. This is another example. This is, not, this is another example of, of you misrepresenting what people say in public meetings. And it wouldn't be the first, it wouldn't be the first time and I'd appreciate it if it was the last time. Um, Thank you very much. The, when, you, when we do public processes, it doesn't mean that everybody, everybody wins. You, a community, you do a community process to build some consensus to, to try to get, to, to deal with most people. We are a diverse society. We are, gonna, we are not all gonna agree on every aspect, but we are trying to work towards these larger strategic goals. And um, I'm not exactly sure what process you participated in, but I just went to a healthy one on Saturday where over 100 people participated in, in, a, in a great process uh, trying to find some standards for Pleasure Point. That's, that's, that's what we do. Um, and uh, people felt heard in that process. Uh, so we're going to try to do the same thing as part of the strategic planning process. Um, we do have an uh, item that has to be, uh, we have an accept and file, so I think I need a motion for that. Uh, so move, accept motion file by support. McPherson. Second. Uh, seconded by Coonerty. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Um, and with that, we will reset what we're ending on.